Hello, I'm Richard Chatterway, CEO of BVA Nudge Unit UK. Uh, and earlier this year, uh, my book came out uh, called The Behaviour Business. Uh, and I want to talk to you about science. Now, that might seem slightly unusual, uh, given that the theme of these talks is about creativity. But my belief is that science and creativity are not in opposition. Um, there is a reason. Uh, my book has pictures of test tubes on the front, as you can see. Uh, and that's because, in my view, you can't have good creativity without science. And actually, when we science the shit out of problems and combine that with creative thinking, we're much more likely to be successful. So my book, as it says here, is about applying behavioural science in business. Um, and whilst the book contains lots of examples of how behavioural science can lead to effective counterintuitive solutions to business problems, I'm aware that probably lots of people watching this um, are in creative industries and may see this cover uh, and the title and go, I'm not reading that, it looks a bit science-y. Um, so I'm not going to talk a lot today about the behavioural science concepts in the book, um, but I am going to talk about one of the key themes, um, which is how science and creativity work together uh, and how being scientific actually makes us more creative, not less. Let me put it this way. Um, I'm recording this at home, as you can see. Um, I haven't travelled more than three miles from this spot for nearly six months um, due to coronavirus. I, I barely had any face-to-face -face interactions with anyone apart from my wife uh, for six months, and I can tell you she's sick of the sight of me. Um, you're probably watching this at home uh, because you're also similarly uh, not able to go out as, as often as you used to. Um, so what's going to solve this problem of coronavirus and allow us to get out and about and lead our normal lives again? Well, the answer is science, um, specifically medical scientists, virologists and immunologists finding a vaccine. But that doesn't mean those scientists can't be creative in the way they approach that problem solving, the way they address those problems. So when I was writing my book, I was trying to find a, a good metaphor for how science and creativity work together. Um, and I wanted to give an example that example today and talk about how creativity and science and scientific method go hand in hand and actually applying in applying creative solutions using a foundation of science we get better answers. So the example I use in my book is from the Oscar nominated movie uh, which is also a book actually or originally a novel called The Martian uh, which many of you will be familiar with. Um, in that film Matt Damon plays a NASA botanist who's stuck on Mars. His crew have departed because they've not unreasonably assumed that he's been killed by an accident during their mission. The reality is that Damon actually survives, um, and Damon's character survives, and he wakes up to the magnitude of his situation. It's going to be several years before a rescue mission can reach him, um, but he only has sufficient supplies to last him a few months. But the thing is, and the film is very much a love letter to the scientific method, he's a highly qualified scientist. He doesn't panic, he doesn't give up and accept his fate. Instead, he decides to solve the problem in the most effective way possible. In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm going to have to science the shit out of this. By way of sciencing the shit out of the problem, Damon consults the notes left behind by his colleagues and experiments using the limited resources at his disposal, including a highly creative way of growing potatoes in his own poo. And no one could deny that's a very creative solution. And without giving too much away, by way of spoilers, that's how he keeps himself alive. Now, I use this as a metaphor because, partly because it's a great movie, but also because it's a useful metaphor for the way science has solved problems in the world we live. The houses we inhabit, the food we eat, the transport we use, the drinks we drink, the medicines that keep us alive. All of these things were developed by scientists using the scientific method. A hypothesis, followed by a deduction, then tested through observation, and repeat. Yet, why is so little work in business scientifically based, with very little to no experimentation? Why are decisions usually made by a group of typically old white dudes sat in a room telling you what they think the answer is? Isn't it time we took this guesswork out of the equation? and started sciencing the shit out of problems. And like Matt Damon with his potatoes, use that grounding in science to creatively grow something that keeps your business well fed. 
fact, if you look at the most successful 21st century businesses, and I have various examples of this in my book, that's how they've achieved success. Jeff Bezos says Amazon's success is a, res- is a function of how many experiments they run per hour, per day, per year. Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, attributes their astonishing recent turnaround to moving from being a know-it-all business to a learn-it-all business. What's particularly baffling is that there's a wealth of scientific evidence out there. We now have a much better idea of what works in a whole range of fields, but in particular, and this is my area of, of, I guess, specialism and expertise, is how to successfully influence behaviour. So why is this important? Uh, It's important because if you're in business, you're in the business of behaviour. What does that mean? Well, at a really basic level, if a business doesn't influence behaviour, it won't succeed. As a business, you need people to buy and use your products and services to generate revenue. You need people to make and deliver those products and services. Or at the very least, you need people to create those products and services or build and program the machines that create them. And you need to do those things better than your competitors to survive and grow. That may seem really obvious, but there's actually lots of things that businesses do that fly in the face of the latest evidence on how and why people behave as they do. Or even worse, businesses frequently don't even try to change behaviour, but merely try to influence perceptions or attitudes, wrongly assuming that behaviour will simply follow. Why is that wrong? Well, it's wrong because there's, if there's one thing to learn from the discipline of behavioural science, it's this. What people do is often not the same as what they say they do or intend to. If a business doesn't employ this understanding of how people make decisions, that we are frequently driven by subconscious or external factors they're not aware of, you're wasting the business's money and that of any shareholders. On the other hand, the good news is that in the last 50 years, we've learned more about how and why people behave as they do than we learned in the previous 5,000. Like advances in medicine, technology and computing, the growth of knowledge in behavioural science has been extraordinary. It's been driven by academic disciplines like behavioural economics, social and evolutionary psychology and neuroscience, as well as the work of a number of dedicated practitioners. I interviewed a number of them uh, in writing my book. So there's a lot for businesses to learn. And if you want to successfully apply this knowledge, you need to take the insights from science and use that framework to create solutions that work. My experience has shown that everything communicates, for example, and how you say something matters as much uh, matters as much as what you are saying. The context in which we receive information and communications is everything, which is why experimentation in that context is so important to understand what works. You don't have to take my word for it. I mean, that wouldn't be very scientific. Um, the beauty of a science-led approach is that by testing hypotheses, you can find out for sure what works in that specific top context. But that's not how we solve problems in business. Often they're based on guesswork, intuition, uh, or what the, hi- the hippo, the highest paid person in the room, thinks. An example of, of how dangerous that is, um, I'm going to talk about how being deferential to someone purely based on them being in a position of authority is not necessarily a good thing. So in 1959, there's uh, a psychologist called Stanley Milgram who conducted some experiments into what's known as authority bias uh, at Yale University. Um, those involved in the experimenter, so this was a, a man in a white coat, instructing participants, who were called teachers, to administer uh, increasingly high electric shocks to a test subject called a learner, um, who was sat in, in the next door room, um, whenever they gave incorrect answers to a simple test. If the person, the learner, protested, they were given verbal, uh, sorry, if the, the teacher protested, they were given prods by the experimenter to continue. Um, in reality, the learner was an actor, so they weren't actually receiving any electric shocks. But the teachers didn't know that. And when they heard his reactions and protests, um, they didn't, had no idea the whole thing was staged. And here's a video to, to give you an example. Answer, or it's... Oh. Experiment, that's all. Get me out of here. 
Get me out of here, please. Continue, please. Go right on. Right. Right. I refuse to go in. Let me out. You refuse to go in. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. Despite this setup, the first set of experiments actually found that 65% of all the teachers administered the maximum 450 volt shock, which would be fatal if it was real. Um, the experiment is controversial uh, on ethical grounds, um, so it hasn't been replicated until quite recently, um, and also due to questions over its validity, but it remains one of the most cited and infamous social psychology experiments. What Mil Milgram was trying to show was that authority bias, which is our tendency to be more in strongly influenced by people with perceived authority, like the highest person in the room, that's so powerful that you could be influenced by someone in a, in a white coat, simply by virtue of that giving them some authority, and their qualifications were never explained in the experiment, you would deliver fatal electric shocks to someone you did not know and could not see. Bear in mind this experiment was happening uh, just 14 years after the end of World War II, and Milgram wanted to demonstrate how normal people could be compelled to commit horrendous acts, uh, many of which obviously happened during the course of, of World War II. So I think the important thing from this is that we recognise that authority need not be based on knowledge or competence, and we cannot assume good intentions of those people in authority. The legendary Hollywood screenwriter William Goldman, who wrote classic movies like Butch Cassidy and The Sundance Kid and The Prince's Bride, he says that the trick to success in Hollywood is remembering that nobody knows anything. I really like this quote of his in particular. Um, when he says that no one knows for certainty what's going to work. Uh, every, every time out, it's a guess, and if you're lucky, an educated one. Daniel Kahneman, who's the Nobel Prize winning psychologist, author of Thinking Fast and Slow, and has a sort of credible claim to being the godfather of, of behavioural economics in many ways, when he's asked if there was what, he had a magic wand and he could eliminate one thing from the world, what would it be? He says the thing he would eliminate is overconfidence. In business as elsewhere, overconfidence and the consequence of overconfidence, which is overoptimism, leads us to make systemic errors. Um, businesses and the people making decisions for them often think they know best, or at least better than their competitors, how to hire the right people, make use of technology, understand their customers, and create and sell products and services. But that completely flies in the face of the evidence that we have. 95% of all new product launches fail. Two thirds of all hires are unsuccessful. The famous industrialist John Runnemaker, although it's often attributed to other people, he famously said, half of all marketing spend is wasted. We just don't know which half. Clearly the majority of businesses are hugely optimistic in most decisions that they make. My view is that where possible, we should be using evidence, not intuitions to make decisions because our biases are so powerful. To demonstrate the impact of some of these biases, I'm going to shamelessly pander to Giles Edwards, who created this brilliant Isolated Talks initiative, um, and talk about uh, the Tottenham and England footballer Harry Kane. Giles is a massive Tottenham fan. Um, even if you don't like footballer, you've probably heard of Harry. Um, he's merely 27 years old, but he's on track to possibly be the greatest English footballer of all time. So by the age of 25, Kane had already won a golden boot for scoring the most goals at the 2018 World Cup. He'd been top goal scorer in the Premier League twice. He'd achieved the record for most Premier League Players of the Month awards and had the best strike rate, 0.7 goals per game, in Premier League history. So you'd assume that someone who was so obviously talented and good at scoring goals, which is, let's be honest, what football's all about, um, would have been spotted at an early age and been identified as a future star. That's not quite how it happened. So as a young player, uh, scout Liam Brady, who himself was a legendarily talented player for Arsenal, um, he rejected him um, on the grounds that he thought he was a, a bit chubby and not very athletic. Uh, Kane was also rejected by Spurs and Watford before Spurs reluctantly decided to give him a second chance. As the journalist Jim White noted, the reason he did not initially turn heads in the academy system was that he wasn't big and he wasn't particularly quick. The two attributes much valued in youth development. How can that happen? Surely literally only job as a football scout is to spot potential in young players. Yet the biases of the scouts were so strong that it led them to focus on entirely irrelevant criteria, how athletic they are, rather than the only thing that matters when finding a striker, whether they can score goals. These biases 
are very powerful. So how do we apply science and the evidence we get from it and creativity to solve problems in business? Now there's a great analogy that Professor Byron Sharp who heads up the University of South Australia's Ehrenberg Bass Institute for Marketing Science uses um, that I'd like to, uh, to tell you about here. Um, so marketing science is the application of the scientific approach and insights from behavioral science to marketing specifically. And bear in mind marketing you know, is often talked about as a creative led discipline. Sharp rejects the argument that marketing and advertising in general must be purely creative and can't be advanced through adopting a scientific approach. He says that marketing is not a purely creative endeavor like art um, because it has the specific goal of influencing behavior, usually to buy a specific product or service, whereas art doesn't. He actually says that marketing is much more like architecture. An architect like Frank Lloyd Wright, and this is his famous house falling water, can create a beautiful house which has obvious aesthetic and creative value. But if they don't obey, uh, obey the laws of physics as a house, it would be useless. Ultimately, without a scientific foundation to write creativity, the house would fall down. In creative terms, uh, the phrase, give me a, the freedom of a tight brief, as someone once said, is a good e example of this. In my work, I find Sharp's analogy really helpful. If you're an engineer, you need to understand physics, but you don't need to be a PhD physicist to build a bridge. Within those constraints given to us by the laws of physics, you can still create something creative and beautiful, but also gets people from A to B across a river or a road. In terms of the work that me and my team uh, do, we're usually given a task to get people from A to B. People currently do A and we want them to do B. We engineer solutions for this using behavioral science. I often get introduced as a behavioural scientist or a psychologist at conferences and webinars and so on. But the reality is, and I have no qualms about admitting this, I'm neither. I'm a practitioner. I've learned through practical experience. Uh, and in any case, when I was at university, it wasn't possible to study behavioural science because it just simply wasn't a separate area of study. It's still a relatively new discipline, as I said earlier. However, more and more governments and businesses are now recognising that a behaviour first, scientifically led approach can use these insights from behavioural and marketing science um, to solve a range of challenges. In my own work, for example, I've used it in a, in a wide range of fields, such as helping people to stop smoking, join the armed forces, drink spirits rather than wine, prevent domestic violence, pay for tu university tuition, submit their taxes, buy flatback furniture and take public transport, amongst others. So to conclude, um, science, behavioural or otherwise, gives you a foundation to creativity and even better, makes it more likely to work. Plus, if you can verify that through experimentation, you can prove it. So how do you go about doing that? Well, firstly, use evidence, not intuitions. Uh, I, I talk about in the book, Test Tube Behaviours which is encouraging experimentation and recognizing as part of that that we can learn from failure as well from success, which requires some humility to say, I don't know if this is gonna work, but let's test it and find out. And what you need to do in terms of creativity is to keep coming up with creative solutions to find those, uh, to fuel those experiments. Just like Matt Damon growing potatoes in his own shit. Thanks very much. <laughs>